Ready, set, go. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. And for those of you who are here for the first time, two things to warn you about. Number one, I like to ramble a lot and I just always go off on a tangent. So if you don't like those types of videos, you're probably not gonna like this one. So you're free to go somewhere else. Uh, number two, I have a lot of very unpopular opinions when it comes to cameras, apparently. Uh, so you'll see a lot of dislikes on this video, probably, and my previous videos, for sure. So if you don't like to hear unpopular opinions, then you're probably not going to want to watch this. Otherwise, I normally review Fuji cameras, Fuji lenses, Fuji everything, right? But since we're here inside quarantine because of the COVID-19, I figured, well, let me go through my images and see what I can post and what's good, what's not good. I guess re-analyze whatever images I had that I initially thought weren't good and see if maybe I could do something with uh, my other images. So I stumbled upon some images of this camera right here. Now, this camera is the Yashica 200 AF. Now, it's weird, uh, but yeah, Yashica did make some AF cameras at some point starting in 87 and they uh, ended with their last camera, the AF300 in 1993. So yeah, and um, I do have a lot to say about this camera. Um, it's gonna be a three-parter and, and the reason why it's gonna be a three-parter is because there's a lot to unpack, there's a lot to say, I have a lot of opinions about this camera and a lot of thoughts. So it's gonna be a really long video if I don't make it into a three-part series. So because of that, we're gonna do that. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, this is the Yashica AF200 or 200 AF. I don't even know why I keep saying the ops. It just sounds better when you say Yashica AF200. Either way, we're gonna start reviewing this camera right now. So stay tuned. So this is the Yashica from the front. You can see that it's a very basic SLR. I'd say it's pretty compact in nature. You can see over here where it says the 200 AF. Uh, the grip is very nice, it's very comfortable. Like your pinky kind of dangles, but it's still comfortable because it's so nice and big. So even though the camera is relatively small and then not that much bigger than an X-T2, if that gives you any comparison, uh, it's a very nice camera to hold. Now, again, you know, pinky dangles, and I'm not a particularly big person by any means, though my hands are a bit bigger. Um, so there's that. Over here, you're going to find your AF assist lamp, right? Then you're over here, you're going to find your lens release button. Down here, you're going to see your screw drive. Right now, it's uh, retracted, which means that you're on AF mode, which is going to be right here on the side. I'll show you the switch in a minute. But if you put the camera on autofocus, then the screw drive comes out. Now, when the screw drive is out, you cannot manually focus. There's no full time manual focus on any of the lenses. If you try to manually focus while it's on um, AF, you're probably going to break the lens because um, it's not going to break the screwdriver. So always be careful and be mindful of that when you're wanting to switch to MF. The lenses do not have any way of full-time manual focusing. So just be aware of that. Um, what else? Okay, so here on the side, let me kind of rotate it a little bit. You're going to see right here. I'm probably going to, there we go. That's the AF MF switch, right? So it's easy to switch and that's pretty much going to be it for the front. Now, if we're going to look at the back, I can show you some of the features that you're going to find in the back. So let's turn it around. And well, I wanted to say there were some features, but apparently there aren't any. Um, you do have your let me move the camera over here. There we go. Um, right there. All right, so you do have your shutter release uh, port right here. I don't know what type of uh, cable you're, you're able to use, if you can use just any um, shutter release cable, but 
that support right there. Here you have the viewfinder. You don't have any eye relief, or at least I don't have the one that came with the camera, but that's going to be it for the back. Now, if we look at the, I do have a roll of film loaded and I'm gonna show you how it works, but that film is probably expired. It's been there for quite some time since my lenses or since the camera started having issues. So, and I only had like five shots in that roll. They weren't very important. So I decided not to take it out, but it's really cool because then I can show you how to, you know, open the back. Actually, why don't we just do that right now? I'm going to open the back. Let's see. Well, if I do this, will it? Yeah, because down here is your your rewind uh, button. So right here, you're going to see. Let's see back here. Let me move this a little bit to the side and then we can push and open. And if there were any images in there, it's now fully exposed. And move it over here. It's a bit weird, but I have it in manual focus because uh, I don't want the focus jumping all over the place. So bear with me and excuse me if sometimes it goes out of focus. So this is the camera right here, fully opened. You do have your uh, DX coding. So right now, let's see what we could do here. Let's see, take this out. Right. All right, so there's that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna roll this back in and then we're gonna try to go over how to put a roll of film in the camera. The camera has batteries and it should uh, advance the film just fine, but I guess I'm gonna go over this real quick because some of you guys might want to know how to put a roll of film. So you see right here, also you have your shutter curtain, which is not made out of cloth like a lot of cameras were in the 80s. You can clearly see that it has a very 80s look. It has a very like 80s aesthetic to the camera. So let me just do that real quick and then we'll come back and uh, I guess do the demonstration. So, all right, so the roll is almost rolled in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put the roll right here and I'm just going to Basically put it just under the line and then let's, oh, what's going on here? All right, that didn't sound very good. Hopefully the camera's okay. Well, I mean, it's already broken, but anyway. So you turn it on up here and I'll show you guys the top view of the camera, but you turn it on. I don't know if you heard that, but yep, it's right now advanced to number one and it turned itself back off. So to show you the top view and uh, we'll be right back. Okay, so right now we have the top view and you can kind of see right now what I was talking about when the shutter, um, when I was talking about the shutter, the, the uh, rubber on the shutter, it's really soft, it's very nice. You barely touch it and it's already turned on. Remember I had, you know, turned the camera on. So right now it's on AF single. It advanced to the first roll. Um, let's, it turns off because uh, the sleep mode for whatever reason doesn't stay for very long. So first roll, it's in program. You can change that if we go to the modes. Right now you go to mode and what happens is it keeps staying in program. So you have to press and hold and then it goes to shutter priority, manual, aperture priority, back to program, and then shutter priority, manual, aperture priority. And you can kind of see how it moves as you kind of block the light. Um, what else? So the drive, same thing, same concept. Right now it's on single, timer, and then continues and it changes over here and says CAF, which is basically continues out of focus. 
single AF timer and it also goes back so you don't have to go all the way around with this little switch lever type thing so that's pretty much your setup it's very basic it's, it's very easy to do if you want to see the bottom i'm going to unscrew it right now because i'm going to show you the, how you can rewind your film that's pretty much it as far as what the camera has to offer it doesn't have a built-in uh, flash unfortunately some other models did have this this weird robotic looking flash looks very 80s uh vintage type um, and it just mounted on top and it added this big bulky thing here up at the top um, And I wish I had one to show you guys You know what what I'll do is I'll just put a picture somewhere around here that way you guys can see it And yeah, that's pretty much it for the top view now Let's see the bottom and then show you how to rewind the film and then I'm gonna show you some sample images And then from there, I think I'm gonna just leave it at that because I've already talked a lot about this camera And you guys probably would just want to see some sample images I'm gonna have those right after I show you how to rewind the film. So here you're going to have your safety button so that way you don't roll your film accidentally. And then you have this little lever right here with an arrow um, so that way you know where to pull. So you're gonna press that and and it rolled it back up and it shows you that you're at zero, it starts blinking. And then that lets you know, let's see if I can actually get it in right there. See, it shows that it says it's at zero right now. So you're ready to remove your canister and it should, and again, it has a button here like we talked before. And with this button, you press that so you don't accidentally open your film back. And then you press that, you pull, I know it's a bit finicky, it's because I'm trying to show you guys how to do it. And your canister is ready to go with your film. So it's pretty much going to be it. Now, if you're wondering what the shutter sounds like, it's a bit loud. Uh, and when the mirror slaps, it, you can definitely hear this. It's just not a stealthy, quiet camera. So here we go. All right, I'm gonna do that again. And pay attention how this small lever right here moves. So when that lever moves, it basically controls the aperture. Um, so if you set it at a certain aperture, when you focus, obviously you're focusing with the lens wide open and then whenever you set your aperture to whatever it is that you set it to this will close it as the uh, shutter actuates and the mirror flips so then you're able to basically take the image at the correct exposure all right so on this side we have the battery compartment on the right side of the camera so to open it up you can use any flat item i have this dime or 10 cent coin here in the US and then you open it up you unscrew it a few times and then it comes out now it takes three triple a batteries I don't know if you can see them yep right there three to triple uh, a batteries and then Right here, it kind of has this like groove thing where you have to match it to the camera. Otherwise, it won't close. So you come right here and you make sure that those align because otherwise you're going to battle with the camera for a while to be able to close the battery compartment. These last a very long time. I mean, I use this camera. I two years now still has what it looks like a full battery so um, yeah that's the battery compartment all right so now that we talked about the camera and we walked around kind of seeing everything that there there is to know about the camera how to use it how to operate it and all that other stuff let's talk about the system itself right so the system was released in 1987 so two years after Minolta had released their alpha system 
With that, throughout those uh, six years that they were manufacturing the cam these cameras and lenses, they also made 13 lenses for Yoshika, or at least that were branded as Yoshika, because Kyocera also made six or seven lenses that were compatible with the uh, uh, Yoshika AF cameras, but were basically Kyocera branded lenses. Two of those were only like truly Kyocera, or at least batched as Kyocera, but made by Yoshika, who knows? Kyocera owned Yoshika, so for all I know, you know, it could have been, that could have been the case. But the point is that you had 13 plus six or seven, you know, you, you had over 20 lenses to choose from, four primes, 24 2.8, 28 2.8, a 50 1.8, and then a 60 2.8, which was a macro. There were a lot of 20 to 70s, 35 to 70s, which were very popular uh, during the 80s. Remember, Canon used to have a uh, 35 to 70. Uh, Nikon used to have a 35 to 70. Minolta used to have a, a 35 to 70. Pentax used to have, so it, it was par for the course. Olympus also used to have that for their, their OM, uh, what was it, OM677, which was also Olympus' first and only attempt at autofocus cameras back in the 80s. So you had a few lenses to choose from. There was also an adapter. It wasn't really, wasn't, it was an adapter, right? It was an adapter with, with some elements. It was a six, 1.6 times teleconverter that converted uh, contact Yashica lenses, right? You could mount those here. Problem was this pentaprism isn't really optimized for manual focusing. So I, I mean, I've never tried it, but I could probably guess that it wasn't very good. Uh, so yeah, that was pretty much it. They did have some flashes. I'm not gonna get too involved in those because I have no knowledge of them. Uh, I didn't buy any of them and my camera certainly didn't come with one. It doesn't have a pop-up flash either. But yeah, that's pretty much it as far as what the whole system was, what, how long it lasted, how many lenses it had. Looking back today and to conclude, because I get, I guess this video has already turned into what, uh, maybe like 15 minutes or so. This is something that I would say could have been better. And, and the way it could have been envisioned, see, Yashica was already working with contacts, right? Kyocera comes into the game and Kyocera has no optics, no cameras, no cameras. They have no experience in the photo photography field, right? So they could have made it into a three tier system, starting with Kyocera, which was bottom of the barrel, uh, you know, cheap, uh, cheap alternatives to, you know, to that system. Then you could have had middle of the road because Yashikas were really good. Back in the day, the reason why people bought Yashikas were because they were good. And that's why contacts partnered with them. They were really good. They had a good reputation. And then you could have had middle of the road, which was really good quality for a good price. Yashika cameras with Yashika lenses and also top of the line contacts bodies with Carl Zeiss lenses, which would have been a better system. And then they could have, I guess, developed it further and not just quit after six years. Who knows? Point is that they really didn't put a lot of effort into it. Now, this is the first iteration. The autofocus is pretty bad. Uh, I would say that the lenses were good. And then I'll show you videos where we can pixel peep on part three when I have, uh, you know, the digital files and we can zoom in and kind of see what, you know, what kind of resolution those lenses had. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much going to be it. If you have any questions, if you, uh, anything else you want to see, just leave it down below in a comment. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you have any suggestions, maybe also leave them down below. Again, part two and part three are going to be coming soon because I have nothing else to do being here at home. I hope that you were able to learn something from this. If there's anything else that comes up, I will definitely add it to part two and three. 
Uh, if you guys have any questions that you want me to add, uh, answer in part two and three also, please let me know. Um, and that's going to be it. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, I'm just, I'm just gonna peace out. All right, guys, catch you guys in the next one.